Guys, last week we began a journey in studying the life of Paul. And I kind of talked about how some of my favorite teachings that I've done since I've pastored this church have been looking at different characters through the scriptures and really examining their kind of story or their life. I, I called it a character study. I don't really know if that's the right language to use. But I talked about how we looked at Daniel, how we looked at David, how we looked at Peter, and we looked at these different characters in Scripture, looked at their lives, and really tried to draw out uh, aspects of their walk with the Lord and their testimonies and, and the, their kind of scriptural accounts and see how it relates to us. And that brought us to the place of Paul, where we're actually looking at Paul's life and his ministry. Eventually, we're going to talk about his death and some of the things that happen as a result of that. Um, and it's so rich. There's so much in Paul's story. There's so much in Paul's teaching that I'm excited to kind of unpack and unravel. We're not going to do an exhaustive thing, especially not this morning. But it, it made me kind of think like, this is kind of like what they're doing in kids' church downstairs. They've been walking through the stories of the Bible and looking at different characters. They're learning about Naaman today downstairs, and they get cookies, which is cool. I don't have cookies for you, but it just kind of uh, made me think of, make me, uh, it kind of made me think of that this morning. And so I apologize for not having like a flannel graph or cookies are here or some kind of illustration to make it super ultra vivid today. I'm not going to sing like a VeggieTales song for you, but we are going to continue in our study of Paul the Apostle and his life and what we can glean from it. And so uh, last week, we really jumped into the beginning of Paul's story. Um, and uh, we understand Paul to be the man responsible for bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. Uh, he's the man who authored more books of the Bible than anyone else. I think last week I said that he authored two-thirds of the New Testament. And that's where it gets kind of weird because I was redoing my math this week and uh, just, just kind of looking over uh, numbers and stuff. And so I feel like I need to make clarification. There's different ways to calculate how much of the New Testament he wrote. And so if you're strictly going by word count, it comes out to less than half. If you're going by uh, verse count or chapter count, that varies. If you're going by the number of books, he wrote more books of the Bible than anybody else, obviously authored by the Holy Spirit. So somebody corrected me on that and said, well, it wasn't two-thirds or it wasn't one-half. And I was like, guys, you get my point. But feeling the need to clarify that this morning, uh, he wrote a lot of the New Testament, if we want to just say it that way. This is the same Apostle Paul. That would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, to imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. To follow me like I follow Christ. A bold claim. And last week we, we kind of walked through this. But before we knew him as Paul the apostle, before we encounter him as Paul the missionary, uh, we know him as Saul of Tarsus. Saul the Pharisee. Saul the persecutor of the church. And we kind of hit on this last week that God never actually changed Saul's name into Paul, right? We, we have this kind of uh, vivid memory that lives in our head if we went to Sunday school or something like that of God changing Saul's name to Paul. But we look at the text and it's not there. The reality is, is Saul is just the Hebrew version of the Greek name Paul. And we see when Paul begins his ministry to the Gentiles, uh, he simply goes by his Greek name more often than he goes by his uh, Hebrew name. And we could talk about more than that later, but uh, I just want to be clear for any of you that are jumping with us this morning. If I refer to Saul or Paul, they're the same person. And that's what's important for today. And so uh, last week when we began to unpack Paul, uh, we looked at his life prior to his conversion. And so uh, some of the things that are just going to be helpful for the framework of our uh, time together this morning. We know that he was highly educated. He was taught by Gamaliel. Uh, he held, who was like a really like famous ancient uh, Pharisee teacher. Um, and uh, he held coveted status as a Roman citizen. He was zealous in keeping with the laws and the traditions of the Pharisees. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was like 
we, I said last week, he was like the most Jewish Jew you could find. He was very, very serious about his faith and his religion that drew him to actively persecute the church and actively persecute the, the followers of Jesus and to the place where we see him uh, coming against the Lord Jesus himself. And so the main point of last week's message was God can use anyone regardless of their background. In fact, he might use you distinctively in spite of your background for his glory. And uh, so we look at that. We look at Paul, right, who is an antagonistic towards the church because of his Jewish faith and his heritage. And God uses him, turns him upside down. Uh, it turns him upside down, turns him up on his head, uses him to bring the message of Jesus and the hope of the gospel to the Gentiles. So it's this pretty kind of crazy 180 transition in Paul's life. And uh, I guess my encouragement would be to not let your history preclude you from what God wants to accomplish with you through your life. And so we've been in Acts chapter 26, so I'm going to invite you guys to turn with me there. Uh, in Acts chapter 26, we see Paul's defense and his testimony being presented before King Agrippa. Uh, and uh, this is the text that we've been basing our teaching out of. Um, so if you would like to turn there in Acts chapter 26, for the sake of review, I'm going to begin in verse 9 this morning. And this is kind of lengthy, um, so thank you, for, uh, thank you for holding on with me. But uh, part of this we studied last week, and it's going to continue into where we are this week. But beginning in verse 9, it says, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in the synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. This is Paul talking about pre-conversion. And so in 12, we begin to embark on the story of where he meets Jesus. It says, while thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when he had fallen to the ground, and then when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And so, again, we talked about Paul's past, which brings us to the moment where everything shifts. And I want to be clear here, it doesn't just shift for Paul, right? This is a, this is a moment of historical proportion for all of humanity where Paul encounters Jesus. And this is, a, this is kind of the natural progression of our study through the life of Paul. And that's where we're going to particularly be setting up camp today is looking at the story of Paul's conversion and what it means for us here today. And so outside of the simple fact, the, the gospel, God chose to bring the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ to the Greek world, to the Gentile world, to us here, I think I found out Lisa was Jewish last week, but almost everybody else that I asked, uh, there wasn't another Jewish person here. Uh, but we see here that God uh, uses this encounter as a catalyst to bring the gospel to the known world. And so we need to recognize that this encounter that Jesus has with Paul sets into motion the gospel of Jesus coming uh, to the Gentiles. 
And today we're going to talk about conversion, particularly Paul's conversion. But before we jump into his encounter specifically, I want to make a statement. And uh, unfortunately, or not unfortunately, I don't really know why I prefaced it with that word. It doesn't sit too well uh, given our current cultural climate. But Christianity is a religion that is entirely founded on the premise of conversion. I want, you to, I want you to begin to wrap your mind around this for a moment because uh, there is an important aspect to Christianity that revolves around converts. And I, I think that's language maybe that we don't like to use a lot. It's not exactly uh, pretty or sexy or these things. Um, and in fact, uh, when I was starting to look at different uh, kind of, uh, what do you call those, statistics? regarding the church and evangelism and these things, uh, I kept coming across this language that we're not called to make converts, we're called to make disciples. And I want to be like, yeah, that's true. I get that. But before you can have a disciple, a disciple starts as a convert. Uh, I want to be clear with that. Uh, if we're not being saved from something, uh, then it kind of makes no sense to, to be saved. <laughs> Uh, there is very, there's this very real aspect of our faith that revolves around this idea of conversion. But the idea of making converts is not a popular one because it draws a hard line in defining that Jesus is right and everything else is wrong. And uh, I think a lot of us have lost sight of that, at least in our culture, maybe not us specifically here in this room, right? The the, the popular bumper sticker that exists on the back of cars is, uh, what was it say? Coexist, Coexist right? It's uh, this idea of this movement that we all just need to get along. Um, and I have this silly uh, bumper sticker that I could not put on the back of my car because the adhesive was gone. But it's, uh, it's a parody of that and it says contradict because uh, they all can't be right. And I want to, I realize that's not popular, that's not fun, that's not like everybody's like, oh yeah, that makes me feel great that people are wrong, or these things. But the reality of it is, <coughs> there is one name given under heaven by which we must be saved, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. And as much as I would like to think, yeah, it would be nice if that wasn't the only way, but Jesus very specifically says, he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. And so either that's true or it's not, but the ramifications for our faith, the ramifications for the way that we live our lives, if that is true, which I'm going to assert to you it is because Jesus said it, um, and his scriptures state it, um, we can't escape that. But I, I want to share some startling statistics with you. LifeWay Research um, published a study in 2016 entitled, Unchurched Will Talk About Faith, Not Interested in Going to Church. That was kind of the, the title of the article uh, that I pulled from LifeWay Research. And this report outlines some interesting um, and almost on the surface level seemingly contradictory opinions about evangelism, specifically amongst millennials. And so that would be my generation those that are born from 1984 to 1998. For the longest time, I didn't know that I was classified as a millennial um, because I don't understand how they break up. It's not like they just gave you like a, like on your ID, it says like what, uh, what generational definition you fall under. And so for a long time, I was making fun of millennials, uh, realizing uh, I was making fun of myself. Then it goes like Gen Z or Gen X or I don't know what we're on now. And so this, this really gives you a great insight into how well first your pastor is in cultural stuff. Anyway, I'm a millennial. I know that now. Didn't know that in the past. But that is where the target of this research was, was going. And so uh, I, I thought these were interesting. And so I just pulled four, uh, four uh, statistics that I wanted to share with you today. Uh, millennial Christians know more unbelievers uh, being close friends or family, when we're talking about knowing, than older generations. That makes sense? 
uh, we have more connections, we have more, uh, there's less Christians in general, so the likelihood of us knowing more in believers makes logical sense there. Almost every single one of the 1,600 uh, millennials that were interviewed here uh, believes that sharing the gospel is a part of their Christian faith. Um, believes that to share the gospel is an important part of their Christian faith. 96% of them said that. So that's, a, that's good news, right? Um, but we go on, and it says here that um, <laughs> I found this one very interesting. So I wanted to hit you with the three really encouraging ones before I hit you with the depressing one. Um, 73% felt that they were confident in being able to share their faith compared to other generations that they pooled at the same time they were doing this. So that was really encouraging. Uh, it sounds like my generation has more opportunity to share the gospel. They feel equipped to share the gospel. And according to 96% of them, they believe that it's an important aspect and part of their faith. This is where all of this unravels for me and just makes me like almost lose my mind is that 47% believe that it is wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in hopes that they will one day share that faith. When we're talking about evangelism here, the Barna Group did a very similar survey in 2019, so three years later, that had almost the same results, except for uh, they had increased slightly. The numbers had increased from 47, I, I believe, to 49%. Um, so nearly half of millennials that were interviewed believe that it is wrong to practice evangelism in hopes that someone would convert. And I, I get this, like conversion, to, to convert people, uh, you know, it robs them of their, of their, you know, there was a, oh, I'm trying to think of the name of the island and the young man that died recently. Um, this is not in my notes, but uh, two or three years ago, there was a missionary who had given his life for the last number of years to identifying a people group off of an island in the Indian Ocean. And I don't remember all of the details about this or the young man's name, but it became a big deal because he finally made contact with this island uh, where he was wanting to share the gospel with them and the islanders wound up killing him. Um, and it became this big fiasco about everybody and their mom were talking about it on the news. I believe I read something in Time Magazine. It was a big deal about people that were saying that this young man was foolish for trying to take the gospel to a hostile people that just wanted to practice their own culture and live in their own beliefs. And it was really discouraging for me to hear the response, even from the Christian community, that really just derailed him as some kind of um, misguided young man that just had a bunch of passion but no wisdom when he was uh, trying to share the gospel with people that had not heard it. And I, I get, you know, I can get why that sentiment is geared up, but the response from the media, the response from Facebook and the people online that I was reading these things were, was like, why can't you just let them have their culture? Why can't you just let them have their beliefs? It is rude and it's some kind of white privilege for you to think that you have to share your faith in Jesus Christ with someone else. And it becomes this almost weaponized thing. And uh, I want to tell you very frankly this morning, regardless of the reception of the gospel, we are still called to share the gospel. We're still called to make converts and obviously make disciples because I want people to turn from the power of Satan to the power of God. I believe that, and I realize that's not popular, but um, and it, it's almost offensive uh, to a lot of people when we say that you have to change, or that you have to um, you have to you have to give your life over to the Lord. And so, um, so what I was writing here is that nearly half of all millennials, and the number is rising amongst the next generation, believe that it is wrong to evangelize. And I, I don't know where the disconnect is. The only way that I can rationalize this line of thinking is that people that answer that question about sharing their faith with someone else 
obviously did not have the same encounter I had when I met Jesus. The only way that I can, can think that someone would think that it is wrong to share the message of Jesus with someone else is that they have not actually authentically encountered the same Jesus that I have. Because the Jesus that I encountered completely changed my life. I was actively worshiping Satan when I gave my life to the Lord, when I encountered the risen Lord Jesus. And my life was completely changed because of an encounter that I had with Jesus. And I'm happy to be converted. I'm happy that my, <clears throat> my culture at the time was offended by the gospel enough and that my life was changed and what was a lie and what was dead was exchanged for something that was real and something that was alive. Does that make sense? And I, I realized that, man, we can look at third world countries. We can look at different people groups and things. And yes, there's, there's aspects of culture that the gospel is not in alignment with, but that is not what's offensive about this. What is, a, what is offensive is people's sin against a holy God. What is offensive is people living in rebellion towards a holy and a living God, not the fact that the gospel requires us to change. Acts chapter 9, friends, uh, if you guys want to turn with me there. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. This is account is fairly long, but I'm going to be reading through uh, verses 1 through 22. It says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? In verse 5, it says, And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And then in verse 7, it goes on. It says, And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but not seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither ate or drank. Now there was a certain man, a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority, and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. I love Ananias' response here. You know, he's having this conversation with the Lord. God, I heard what you told me to do, but you do realize who this guy is, right? <laughs> this is the guy that wants to kill me. This is the guy that wants to imprison me. Are you sure about this? And so he just casually, politely reminds the Lord about this crazy guy named Saul. And goes on and it says, but the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house and laid, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened, and Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. <clears throat> in verse 20, it says, Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not the one? Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem? 
And has he come here for that purpose, so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. I realize we've probably are familiar with some of that story. We read part of it already in Acts chapter 26, but I wanted you to get the whole picture here. And I'm reading out of the New King James version, uh, particularly here because I I do read out of the New King James quite a bit, Um, (coughs) but because it highlights uh, two particular questions in verse five. And so if you want to put verse five back up on the screen, Adam, that would be great. He asks these questions, who are you, Lord? Jesus responds, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But then he goes on in verse six and he says, so trembling and astonished, he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And I feel like these two questions are great questions that mark a genuine genuine conversion that really uh, I think we would take a lot of benefit of asking these questions ourselves. And so the first question that Paul asks is, who are you? And I want to be very clear. I believe there is nothing more important uh, for us to do than know God and to know him rightly and have right understanding of who he is. You see, Paul previously had a misconception about who Jesus was, right? He had this idea that he was a threat to his religious system, that he was a threat to uh, his culture and the things that he knew, um, And uh, the reality was that was nothing like who Jesus actually was. His idea of Jesus being a false prophet and a false messiah were completely misconstrued through looking at it through the lens of his religious system. But when he has authentic revelation and encounter with the person of Jesus, it changes everything. But I love this about Paul was this question, who are you? Uh, it was a question that Paul never stopped asking. If we read in Philippians 3, we read in Philippians 3 last week, but if we look particularly at Philippians 3.10, it says, uh, he says this, he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. There's this cry in Paul to know Jesus more than he does right now. It makes me think of Jeremiah when he, uh, who, Jeremiah 9, 23? I'm looking at Adam like he'll know exactly what I'm thinking about. But uh, (laughs) uh, where the prophet says, um, let the wise man boast in his wisdom and the strong man in his strength and the rich man boast in his riches. Uh, Let not that. I'm, man, I was misquoting scripture already, have the wrong address, just butchering things right now. This is great. Um, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, or the rich man boast in his riches, or the strong man in his strength. I got those out of order. You guys know what I'm saying. But let him who boasts, boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord. Um, did you put it up there? Hey! Oh, did I have the reference right? Yeah. Well, cool. Just the word's wrong. It's all good. Thanks for uh, going on that journey with me. Um, I, strongly, I strongly believe, friends, that this is a question that obviously was asked at Paul's conversion. Who are you? But this is a question that I, I think we can continually come before the Lord and ask. I believe that there is not a day that goes by where we can't know the Lord a little bit better. And it's something that I want to have uh, in my life. And goes on, he says, what do you want from me? And uh, I think this is interesting here because if we read this story, uh, <coughs> the, the immediate response to that question is uh, in verse 6, Lord, what do you want me to do? The Lord says to him, arise, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And so he doesn't really answer Paul's question there. Lord, what do you want me to do? Go into the city, and then somebody will tell you what to do. Is uh, he just gets kind of a small picture? I can't imagine uh, what that might look like if immediately God told him 
everything that he was going to suffer, which we know eventually does happen, all the things that were going to go wrong and how God was going to use him to carry the gospel across the known world and write scripture in these things. Uh, that might have been a little overwhelming at the time. I love that there was a simple uh, response here, but I, one of the things that I, I think is uh, important for us to stand that God ultimately wanted to use Paul on an extravagant scale. We see that, and he did. We, we see that kind of unfold through the rest of the, <clears throat> the rest of the scriptures. We see all these things that Paul accomplished for the Lord. Um, but first, he just had to follow simple instructions. And uh, I believe this, that God is more concerned about your simple obedience than extravagant endeavors. And last week when we were in 1 Timothy, I talked about faithfulness, that God's not so much impressed with your talent or your skill set, but he's far more concerned about your faithfulness <laughs> and the fact, can you be faithful with little, uh, that he might entrust you with much. We talked about that last, uh, that last week, and I, I just want to encourage you once again, uh, I believe that that to uh, simply ring true, um, that if we're not willing to obey God in the little things, in the simple things he asks us, I, I don't think he's going to be too impressed when we try to do these extravagant things for him. We wonder why God hasn't used us in a mighty way. It's probably because we're not being faithful in the little things that he's asked us to do. Does that make sense? Just a, a simple observation there. But last week as we looked at Paul as the chief of sinners his kind of description there. We look at another title that Paul has where he considers himself the least of the apostles. In 1 Corinthians 59, he says, For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I but the grace of God which was with me. And uh, strongly here, I, I, I would like to just highlight that it wasn't out of Paul's own efforts that he encountered the Lord. We understand that this was a suddenly, a spontaneous thing, and it was rooted in the grace of God. But the, the highlight here of all of these things connected is it's the same grace that saves us is the same grace that changes us. I want you to understand that because Paul's conversion with his encounter with the Lord without actually resulting in a change in his conduct and his behavior would have been futile. But we see immediately after him giving his life to the Lord, recognizing Jesus as the Messiah, he begins to be put into action of preaching that Jesus is the Christ. And uh, we see him in his testimony that he's giving, right? The, if you remember, the whole context of where this message is based out of is in Acts 26, where he's standing before King Agrippa, who is not a believer. And we see uh, the ultimate goal of Paul here is at the very end of the, of the chapter in 26, which we haven't got to yet. Uh, he's trying to convert uh, King Agrippa and these different leaders, he wants them to become a Christian. And uh, so it's in this context that, uh, that we read about this testimony that Paul is giving. The validity of Paul's testimony is found in the evidence of a changed life. That's what I love about the life of Paul. That's what I love about his conversion story here is that he was actively trying to hunt the church down he encounters Jesus, and now he's actively trying to build it up. And it's something that makes no logical sense under the sun in any way that you want to look at it. There is no denying that something happened in Paul's life that drastically changed his actions. And I believe if we are to authentically encounter Jesus if we're to authentically embrace him and encounter him as Savior, there has to be evidence of a changed life in the way that we live, in the conduct, in our character that is 
uh, irrefutable. One of the things that I, I think is easy for people to kind of get caught up in is that, you know, people can argue with your theology. People can disregard your, your, your belief in the scriptures. They can accuse you and deny that there's a God. And that's, that's one thing. But one thing that people can not deny is when there is evidence of a changed life of where you were once dead, but now you're alive. Where once you were broken, but now you're whole. Where you were once one way, but now you're another. And they can deny maybe the reasoning why all the way around. But I believe that the evidence of a changed life really serves as uh, probably the, one of the greatest tools when it comes to evangelism that we have. Um, I know for me, at least that was my story. You know, I was drastically living one way and encountered the Lord and set me on a path that was going in a completely counter direction, which opened up the door for me to be very bold and vocal about my encounter that I had with Jesus. And uh, my prayer, friends, is that we would be able to demonstrate that. Some of you are thinking, well, I've been a Christian for so long that I don't even remember what it was like before I was saved. I don't remember, I don't remember these things. And uh, I just want to encourage you. Um, Holy Spirit, I don't know where that thought was going. But I know one thing. I never want to just preach to you to preach to you or say something because I feel like I have to say something. And so I'm not going to do that. But one of the things that I, I would so love for us to pray for as a congregation this morning is as I think about Paul's story, I think about his conversion, I think about his encounter with the Lord, Um, I would so love to have more stories like that begin to fill the church. I would so love to have testimonies of people. I'm not talking, they don't have to be dramatic where, you know, they're falling to the ground and they're blind for three days or something like that. But I just want people to meet the real Jesus. And I want people to meet him in such a way that their lives cannot go back to the way that they were. And I want to, I want to encourage you that if you've really encountered the Lord, it will demand that your life look different than it used to. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't, friends, something's wrong. And I would encourage you to ask those questions with with fresh focus, God, who are you and what do you want from me? For those of you that have been following Jesus for a long time, I think it's a healthy place to be, to ask, God, can you give me fresh revelation of who you are, of how good you actually are? I want to know you personally. I want to know you rightly. I want to know you more than anybody else. And God, what do you want from me? What do you want from me in this moment? A mark of genuine conversion will be that you will make disciples. I believe that with everything inside of me. I I, I don't think we can sit idly by and have the mentality that, you know, uh, preaching the gospel, fulfilling the Great Commission is somehow uh, intrusive enough to where we we just don't want to do it. I get it can be awkward. I can get that it can be difficult and that it can be frustrating. And the response is not always a warm one. 
that we have, but I, I know what Jesus did in my life, and it was too great of a thing to not want to see it happen in other people. Can I tell I think this is I think this is the crazy thing here. We especially when it comes to evangelism, we want people to be at the right place uh, to receive well, right? We want them to be open to the gospel of Jesus, right? Before we try to really kind of bring them to a place of decision. I know that this is my tendency is like, I like to build a relationship. I want to really kind of get in the door and then try to, if it comes up naturally, then yeah, maybe this is how we'll do this. But when I look at Paul's story, uh, he was adamantly opposed to Jesus. And I'm not saying that there's one model fits all for sharing the gospel and evangelism. And I'm not saying just go shove, try to like shove your faith down other people's throats. But what I do know that is effective 100% of the time when it comes to evangelism is if we can position people to encounter Jesus, to hear from him, um, to encounter him, things can change. And that's my prayer. My, my prayer so, so I say this. I think there's a few lessons to learn. These are not in my notes. Um, but as I'm thinking here, um, I think there's oftentimes... We disregard that God wants to do something and we, we, maybe, uh, we maybe just kind of write it off because we don't feel like people are at the right place or the right time in order to receive something as life-changing as the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think that's where we need to be in tune and in step with the Holy Spirit that we never miss an opportunity. Just because someone is hardened and just because someone is antagonistic towards Jesus does not mean that God does not want to do something powerful and mighty in their life. And I just don't want us to, I don't want us to have this mindset, uh, maybe a preconceived notion of how God wants to save and who he wants to minister to. I'm so glad that that didn't happen with me because I was not ready or willing or even open to the idea that God could be real and people still chase me down with the love of Christ. Mm-hmm.